We're in a brand new series called The Hall of Faith, and we are going to be looking this summer at Hebrews chapter 11. So open your Bibles if you haven't already, or open your YouVersion app, and we're going to be walking through stories of faith. And so this is about faith lessons. And last week, we looked at the armor of God as we fight in the spiritual battle. And one of the critical pieces of armor was that shield of faith. And if you remember, it says the shield of faith can extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. And so this is going to be a summer where we learn how to use our armor better, how to, how to fight and how to stand against the enemy. And I want to start with a story about a guy named Forrest Fenn. And Forrest Fenn wrote a book, and it was called The Thrill of the Chase. And he is an older gentleman who has a lot of money. And what he did in this book was talk about a treasure that he had hidden. In fact, at the end, he has a 24-line poem that gives clues about where you can find this treasure. And he had taken a little box, and somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, he had gone and he had hidden this, and it contains gold coins and nuggets and in fact, you can look on the internet now and see all the things that were in, included in the chest, but it was worth over a million dollars, and he was challenging people to seek for it. And over 350,000 people over the last 10 years have gone out into the Rocky Mountains, and they have begun looking for this treasure, and some of them quit their jobs and did it full-time, and some of them just went out for a fun weekend, but 350,000 people looked and the first part, first week of June this year, uh, somebody sent him a picture because somebody had finally found it. And that was huge news, partly because some people had said it doesn't really exist. This is a whole fake. And the reality is, and this is where you need to listen, that those who believed that the treasure existed and those who believed that there would be an incredible reward for the one who diligently sought it, they were the ones that were out seeking. Now you say, why are you talking about that? Well, if you know anything about Hebrews chapter 11, I just echoed something about what the Bible says about our relationship with God. That those who come to God, those who are learning to exercise faith, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that diligently seek him. And I might mention, part of the reason that Forrest Finn wanted to do this was not just to create a sensation and give away a million dollars. He wanted the 350,000 people to get off their couches and quit watching TV and playing video games and get out there and enjoy the beauty of nature. So everybody who sought for that chest actually got some of the treasure. So we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is a unique book in the Bible. Uh, we know that it's from God and it's clearly been attested to since, since the early church. But we don't know exactly who wrote it. So usually we talk about the Apostle Paul or somebody writing it. And in this case, we always have to say the writer to the Hebrews. And most people who study the scriptures have their own idea who maybe it was, but we don't know. And the author is writing to a group of people called the Hebrews, meaning the Jewish people. And they were in a particular stressful time. These were people who had been raised in the following the traditions of worshiping in the temple and doing the sacrifices. And, and they had been, their identity was that they were Jewish people chosen by God. And now the Messiah had come and Jesus had been proclaimed. And in fact, he had been crucified and raised from the dead. And yet they're in this place where they're deciding whether to step in faith to trust in Jesus or whether they're going to go back into and shrink back into the old ways, the old rituals, the old the things that they had known before. And so the writer to Hebrews is challenging them, to take steps of faith, to trust in Jesus, to believe that he is the way that they need to go. And so it's a valuable part of how God wants to challenge us to live by faith as well. So let's look at that verse that I just referred to in chapter 11, verse 6. And it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must, first of all, believe that he exists, and number two, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, this was a critically important question in my own life because it's an absolute foundational question for everyone. Is there a God? And it's a difficult question sometimes because God is invisible, and, and honestly, he doesn't run the world like we think he should most of the time. Uh, we think that if there is a God who is all-knowing and powerful, that the world should be full of justice and that 
that there shouldn't be all of the suffering and all of the unanswered questions that we have. And so Satan uses that opportunity to send an arrow of doubt. Remember last week we talked about that the shield of faith is for the arrows of doubt. And the danger of the arrow is not the hole that it leaves, but the fire that it starts. Now, doubt can can come in and it can begin working on you. And and that was my story as a young man. I I knew about God. I had been raised to follow Christ. I had learned about the Bibles from the time I was young. And then I, I went to school. And then in the time when There's all kinds of Eastern mysticism, and it says you must believe that God exists. And is there really a God, or is it Mother Nature, or are there spirits, or there is no God? And then it says he rewards those who diligently seek him. And you know, I I was being assaulted with arrows of doubt. And God answered that doubt. He gave me faith in a very unique and specific way. Um... I was in a new high school uh, over in Coos Bay and uh, was interested in this young lady and we were kind of starting to talk and uh, not really dating yet. But, you know, the time comes when you get your pictures taken and we were exchanging pictures and, and she wrote a nice little note on the back of her picture and at the bottom she put this reference. It said First Chronicles 28.9 and uh, I didn't know what that was. So I went and looked it up and thought it was pretty cool that she knew a verse I didn't. So I went and looked that verse up, and it's this important point where King David is trying to prepare his son Solomon to take over the kingdom of Israel, and and it's going to be a huge responsibility, way beyond Solomon's ability. And so he gives him this piece of advice, hard-earned from many years of walking with God, and he says like this, and you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father. Serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and he understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. And if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And somehow God used that verse to be a huge infusion of faith for me. Because I had been doubting secretly inside of myself, wondering if there really is a God or not. And if the Bible that I had been taught was really the truth or not. And and the evolution had been proclaimed in my school and all kinds of other ways of thinking. And I was in a storm of doubt. And somehow that idea that God knew every thought already, that, that God didn't flicker in and out of existence as I believed or didn't believe. And in fact, God wasn't shocked or surprised by the struggle I was having. And, and it opened a door in my heart and this may sound silly, but I begin to pray to God about my doubts. You know, sometimes you feel like I'm saying, okay, God, I don't, even, I don't even know if you're there today, and I certainly don't know if you're listening. But in case you are. And I begin to talk to God about my doubts and my struggle, and, and it opened a door in me. And I, and I thought the next phrase was pretty stark as well. It says, if you seek him, he'll be found by you. In fact, in the King James where I learned it, it says, he will let you find him. And it says the alternative, if you reject him, he will cast you off forever. So God knows my doubts. And at that point, I realized what a high stakes decision this is. And it is a high stakes decision for all of us. What does it mean to believe that God exists? What does it mean to diligently seek him? What is faith and how do we build it? How do we, how do we learn about that? And I hope that you will join us all summer long as we go through various stories. Because Hebrews chapter 11 is a whole list of stories about people who have gone before us, who have found that God is faithful, who have believed that he existed, who have sought him diligently, and God has seen them through. And so the definition I want us to work with as we talk about this whole simple question of what is faith is like this. It's a trust in God that leads to obedience. You see, all of us trust something And the question is, is your trust really in God or is it in people or is it in your own self-strength or is it in something else or someone else? And so where is your trust is the first question. It says a trust in God, but this is not just an intellectual, yeah, I know that this is true. This is a trust that leads to obedience. In fact, let's boil it down to the most simple form. The two simple words are trust and obey. The trust in God that leads to obedience. If you were raised in the church, if you know hymns, you're already singing that song in your mind. 
It says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still as with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And I, I thought even as a kid growing up when I heard that song, how that's so foundational and so basic to everything that the scripture says and to everything that it means to walk with God. And so our challenge this summer as we walk through this is how do we learn to trust God more? How do we become more obedient and more responsive to God? And one of the things that I have been impacted by, I heard this from a message once, and he said simply, faith is a history lesson. That the way that I trust God for the future is by going back and looking and seeing that God is trustworthy. I don't, I don't trust him just because, because I'm just hoping that he'll help, help me. In fact, an unbeliever told me one time that I think faith is believing what couldn't possibly be true. That, that's not it at all. It, the reality is, is God is trustworthy, and there have been millions of people who have found him to be so. And so you, you think about how much of the Bible is stories. It's tales of real people in real struggles, often with far less information than we have, and how they responded to God. And everybody in here is an example. Some are good examples and some are bad examples. But there are stories all the way through. In fact, I think that's why we, we use this term, the hall of faith. It's kind of built on the idea of the hall of fame. And this is the baseball hall of fame where you see the plaques on the walls of the, the people who have not only played well, but have played well for a long period of time. And, and you see statues of people like Babe Ruth and Ted Williams and these, these people who are incredible historical figures of people who played the game well. And I like this picture of the kids looking up at the statues because I think one of the roles of heroes is to inspire us. That, that they went through the same kinds of struggles and they came out on top. And, and the Hall of Fame it isn't for one-hit wonders. It's not somebody who had a great season. It's people who endured and kept playing and playing well and rose to the top of their profession. And in that same way, we're going to walk through the stories of the Old Testament. The stories of Noah Stories of Abraham and Sarah, the stories of Moses, and, and we are going to look at how God met them, and we are also going to look at the flaming arrows that came at them and how God built their faith. And the flaming arrows sometimes have different names. Sometimes it's the arrow of self-doubt. Sometimes it's the arrow of self-will. And you begin to say, what are the ways that we use faith to help put those arrows out? And so we're going to walk through that story. And let me just, oh, one more thing is also, I think it's important not only that you look at the stories of Scripture, I think this also should become a personal exercise for us, is that there are many times in Scripture where God tells them to pick up a, a stone and make a, a pile of stones or to have a specific memorial because it's easy for you and I to be desperate in our prayer for God and asking him to answer. And then when he does, it's easy for us to say thanks and then go on to the next thing. And that faith is a history lesson also in our own lives. That You and I need to go back and review how God has answered prayer and how he's met our needs. And, and every time I tell a story about how God has been faithful to me, it builds my faith. Because in the, in the present, there are so many things coming at you, it's easy to get, again, losing your focus, losing your faith. The flaming arrows are coming all the time. And when I review what God has already done in my own life, it helps me to, to get that shield up there and to stand and to press forward. So I hope you will not only learn some Bible stories, but you will also learn some more about your own stories and that you will let God use those to build your faith. So let me read you the first part of Hebrews chapter 11. So it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and it is assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So he says that faith is invisible, you can't see it, but it is a confident hope that God is going to come through, that God is true, that he is telling us the truth. And then it says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed as God, at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So that starts with creation. That exhibit A in the hall of faith is creation. 
And in fact, this underscores the fact that faith is reasonable, that faith isn't just a vague hope in something that is a fairy tale and we don't know. It's reasonable. It's founded on history. It's founded on facts. And he says, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now, in our, our current world, the, the secular humanist point of view that is reflected in much of our education system teaches that we believe in science and that we came from a long process of evolution where it was dog eat dog and kill or be killed and eventually we've come to the pinnacle of evolution, which is humans. And it is such a huge difference in paradigms that either you look at the creation and the stars and the beauty of the universe and you either respond with skepticism God couldn't possibly be that big. It, it, it's too incredible. Or you respond with worship and wonder. Like, wow, it's incredible that God is that big and look at all that he has done. And so this is that foundation stone that if you don't believe that God created the world, then you will begin to find excuses for how to run your life instead of following in faith and following God. And in fact, this is one of those critical moments where you choose to believe that what God said is true. And all the way through scripture, God keeps pointing back to creation. Because in Romans 1, it says that creation is the gospel that everybody can hear. Everybody can see. It goes into the whole earth, Psalm 19 says. So every single person has a chance to look around and they say, wow. And we've spent time before talking about evidences for creation, that you can be a creationist believing in the scriptures and still use your full brain, that there are ways of understanding the evidence that fits with a biblical account of creation. But I, I don't want to spend time on that. I want to actually look at a more very personal part, which is when I look at creation, I, I say, God created me. I am one of the exhibits in creation. And here's a very simple thing that helped me in this process. We are relational, self-aware, creative, moral, rational beings. If you look at all of humanity, and by moral, I don't mean that we always do what's right. I mean that we know things are right or wrong, and everybody has a sense of right or wrongness. So if that's what we look at human beings and go, I mean, being a, having a human body, being a human is an incredible thing. And you either believe that it came about completely by accident or that I was knitted together and formed by a creator. So this is the evidence. We are all of these things, and we could not have come from a pointless, undirected, accidental explosion. See, the, these two worldviews couldn't be further from each other. The, the, the story of secular humanism, the story of secular evolution, is that there was an explosion billions of years ago, and somehow all of the planets, all of gravity, all of the, the life that eventually just popped up on planet Earth out of rocks and chemicals and all of the things that happened, all of those came about with no purpose, no plan, no destiny, nothing. It just happened. It was a complete accident. And when you look at all of creation and all of the evidence around and you say, could all of that have come simply out of accidents? I think you have to come back to the simple fact <laughs> that billions of years does not make the impossible possible. Or to say it in a funny way, you can kiss a million frogs and you'll never get a prince. You can keep trying and trying and trying, but if it's impossible, it's impossible. Somehow they keep saying millions of years and we think, oh, that makes it possible. But the reality is when we look at all that God has made us to be, it's because God is a relational, self-aware, creative, moral, rational God. We are evidence because God says in creation that he was making us in the image of God. That we are not little gods, but we have in our nature things that clearly point to God. That the created thing never rises higher than the creator. That the thing never rises higher than its source. And so, without saying more, let me just point out that that is a step of faith, but it is a reasonable step of faith. And the second story 
that he tells us in Romans 11 shows that faith is responsive. And if you remember the simple definition, it's trust and obey. And by obey, I usually think of doing something active. But you know, as I read through Hebrews 11, and as we walk through this story, you're going to find out that sometimes it's trust and wait, that we're waiting on God, that we're trusting him in the time in between what he says and what actually happens. And the story that he presents is the story of Cain and Abel, two sons of Adam and Eve. And it says, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. So in the story in Genesis, Cain and Abel, they both bring an offering to God. And it says that Abel brought God a better offering. And we're going to talk about, we're going to read in Genesis what that is. But it says that he responded by faith. He trusted God and he did what God asked him to do. So it was pleasing to God. And, and I want to just look at this last line. It says, by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. That means that the faith decisions you make last a long time, that you impact your children and your grandchildren. And this is Father's Day, and, and I know that in my story, my father is a critically important part of that faith that he has, has so impacted my life. And I, and I don't know about you. I don't know if your father is a part of your faith story Dads, I hope that you are taking this to heart, that that's one of the most important things you can pass on, is not how to change a tire or how to balance a checkbook, but how to have a faith and trust in God. And I hope that that this is an encouragement to you, dads, that you can speak long after you're gone if you have a life of faith. So this is in Hebrews. So that's all it says there. Let's go back to the story in Genesis. It says, now Abel kept the flocks and Cain worked the soil. So they had different kinds of occupations, kind of had separated out. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So he brought what he had from his garden. And then it says, and Abel brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. So an offering was clearly a sign of gratitude. It was clearly also acknowledging that that this came from God. Then there's the story changes. And it says, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So I don't know exactly how God showed that he was choosing one or the other. And of course, one of the controversies is, did they already know ahead of time? Um, And we don't know that. I, I suspect that they did, partly because of how God responds. But nevertheless, God said, Abel, good job. Cain, try again. And what was Cain's response? Now, now I think some of the, what they offered clearly also indicates their heart response. Abel gave something that was the first, and it was valuable, and it was important. And so that shows his heart. Cain gave something, and when God corrected him, he got angry. I was thinking, this is, this is one of those flaming arrows. This is that, that flaming arrow where I, I have to acknowledge that I was wrong, that I have to accept, rec- re- I have to accept correction, And and the flaming arrow is self-will. I want to do it my way. Look what happens. It says, Cain was angry and his face was downcast. I think in the early Hebrew, that really says he threw a hissy fit. He, He got irritated. Listen carefully. God audibly spoke to Cain. He knew God was there, but Cain got mad because God's will was different than his will. See, instead of, as Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Cain said, not your will, but mine be done. And what happens? God speaks to him. God appeals to him. God's trying to reach Cain. In fact, if you read the story, God talks to Cain more than he did to Abel. And he says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? This isn't, you're not, you're not out. I'm asking you to change, to correct. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. There's a wild animal that's about to eat you up, Cain, and it's called self-will. And so he wants Cain to respond, and he wants Cain to listen. And instead of Cain being humble and repentant and seeing that he needs to change, <laughs> he gets angry at God, and he gets angry at his brother, and he goes out and he kills his brother. That instead of changing his heart, he murders his brother. And I, and I think of how powerful a statement that sin is crouching at your door. And later on in Romans, the Apostle Paul says in chapter 14, 
Whatever is not of faith is sin. That faith means trusting God and obeying Him. Doing it His way, it means surrender because God is right. And so, faith is reasonable. Faith is, now, we looked at this part where it is um, responsive to God, listening to God, obedient to God. And then the, last, the next one is that faith is relational. And I love this picture, and it's, it's a very brief picture, but he brings up the story, a minor character named Enoch. And Enoch is just a little further down the road from, uh, he's actually a son of the, a great-grandson of Seth, who was, who was the next son that Adam and Eve had. And he talks about God now in a different term. When we talk about obeying God, you can either see him as a, a cruel master who's demanding obedience, or you can see him as a loving father who's saying, let's do it my way. Let's do it the right way. And, and this is a simple story. It says in Hebrews, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. That's a quote from Genesis. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And sometimes we get this idea that pleasing God is really working hard and I've got to do all the right thing and I've got to sacrifice a lot. And, and you, know what? you know what Enoch did to please God? Let's go back to Genesis. It says, Enoch walked faithfully with God for he, and he was no more because God took him away. That's it. That's all we know. It creates this picture like Adam and Eve before the fall had gone walking with God in the cool of the evening and, and had had these conversations. And it talks about a whole way of life where he walked faithfully with God. You know, I think sometimes we would love to do great big steps of faith, but faith is quite often one small step of a time, not, not some great leap. And, and I have a good friend named Rick, and, and we go walking together a couple of times a week. And in that walking, we share and we talk. And I, I don't trust people easily. And I, I don't talk a lot about what's going on inside of myself generally. But when we walk together, there's time and there's this closeness of relationship. And over time, I, I found him such a great listener and such a great encourager. And, and that walking together has built our relationship. And I love that picture of Enoch just walking with God. And, and it shows even in the Old Testament, that God was longing for that connection and that relationship. And remember back to Forrest Fenn's treasure? It, it wasn't only the treasure chest he was trying to get people to do. He was trying, trying to get people to enjoy the beauty in, of nature. And God is trying to get us to enjoy the beauty of his nature, of walking with him and getting to know him and letting him get to know us. And, and I heard a a story our pastor said one day, he said, you know, I think God and Enoch were such good friends and they were walking and talking a long time one day and finally God said, my house is closer. Why don't you just come home with me? And Enoch is one of the few people that we know in all of history that didn't die. He just was transported to be with God. And so it underscores the fact that God desires a relationship with us. He wants to know us and he wants us to know him. I guess he already knows us. He wants us to know him. And then the last point, and this is kind of where we started, is that faith is essential. Um, he says it's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to come to God without faith. Because if you understand anything about the, the good news about Jesus, is that we have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That he is God who came in the flesh. That he gave his life. That he became the sacrifice for us so that we could have a relationship with God so that our sins could be forgiven and, and we could be connected. And either that is the, the absolute most important truth in the universe, that is, and you will either accept it and find the treasure, and that's the cool part about God's thrill of the chase, thrill of the seeking it, is that everybody gets the treasure chest. God is the treasure. And that there is a beauty and a joy in seeking him, not just at the beginning, but seeking him with our whole life. He says in the end of the chapter right before Hebrews 11, he, he warns them severely, don't you turn back. It is death, eternal death to turn back from pursuing Christ. And then he says, we do not belong to those who shrink back and, and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. You see, there are those who follow and find the treasure, find Christ forever. So let me ask you a quick question. In that process of the ups and downs of life, and as we've gone through 
COVID-19 and all of the division and all of the difficulties and all of the hard things, what is it that you really trust in? And I think when things get shaken, we find out what's unshakable. There's a great tendency for us that when we are stressed out, when there, all kinds of difficulties are going through our lives, that we can trust in people, we can trust in ourselves, we can trust in <laughs> the government or the news, or we can trust in the last person we talk to, or, or we cannot trust anybody and just live in, in a sense of, of fear and, and, and anxiety. And so this is a critically important question. What happens when you are pressed? What goes on in your mind? What's the self-talk? What's the, the dialogue inside? And the question is, is in that struggle, do you earnestly seek God? Do you spend time in prayer? Does that occur to you? I'm, I'm amazed myself at how, how quickly I can go into fix-it mode or trust somebody else or call somebody and that my first thought is often not prayer. And we talked last week about the, not only the shield of faith, but the sword of the Spirit. And do I go to the Scriptures? Do I fill my mind with this? Or do I fill it with Facebook? Or do I fill it with the news? Do I fill it with my own anxiety? And so, look back in the last couple of weeks. How has your faith expressed itself? Has it led you to seek after God and to, to trust what is unshakable? Or have you been involved in all of this stirring up? And has your mind been filled with everything else? You know, COVID testing <laughs> could be a lot more about our faith than about the virus. So we need to ask God to build our faith and to help us to extinguish the flaming arrow of anxiety, the flaming arrow of doubt, the flaming arrow of self-will. And we're going to look at several more of those as we walk through Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to close with this story. There was a, a pastor that went over to visit a family, and they had just been through a really hard time. Uh, their young daughter had gone through a long bout with cancer and had finally passed away. And, and as he was coming over to, to just grieve with them and to perhaps uh, make some arrangements for the funeral, uh, he noticed there was an engraved stone in the entryway, and it, it said, the moon is round. That kind of struck him as odd, but he went on and he visited with the family and and after they had talked a while, he said to him, I, I would like to ask you, what, what is that statement, the moon is round about? And they said, oh, that, that's a great story. That's really important. He said, we were going through our daughter's things after she died, and we found a journal. She had a lot of her struggle with how did she believe God through all of this, and there were Bible verses in there. And then there was this note card. It was just an index card, and on it was written that simple statement, the moon is round. And we thought, what's that? And they realized that when she was lying there in her bed, looking out the window, that she had seen the moon in many different phases. And sometimes the moon looks like a fingernail. and Sometimes it's a quarter round, and sometimes it's half there. And somehow that understanding of faith that says, no matter what it looks like, the moon is still round. That even if there's barely a sliver, that the moon itself is still round. And and they said, you know, that came to be such a meaningful statement of faith for her that no matter what my experience, no matter what I feel, no matter whether I sense God being close to me, no matter whether it all makes sense to me, God is still there and that God is still good and that God is trustworthy and that my faith needs to rest in him because he is worthy of my faith. And they said that was such an important spiritual lesson for her that we had it engraved on the stone because we never want to forget that. And I'm going to close in prayer and I'm going to ask that you join me in prayer as we talk together to God about how our faith is and how it can grow. Father, thank you for the stories of Scripture, the many characters who show us, God, that you are there and that you are, a, you are a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. That God, we come again and again to these circumstances in our life, and I'm convinced that at every new stage, there's a new test of faith. Every time there's a disappointment in what we hoped would happen, every time we face into a hard thing, you look at us and you say, will you trust me in this? God, by faith, we want to say, yes, we trust you. Lord, we live 
where there's a lot of flaming arrows. We struggle with doubt and we struggle with self-will and we struggle with all kinds of these flaming arrows. God, I pray that you would help us to use their shield of faith so that we can put those fires out. The arrows will come, the fires will start, but by faith, God, we want to extinguish them so that we can walk with you. So I pray for each one who's listening, for everyone who's struggling. God, you would challenge us to live by faith and to earnestly seek you. God, we will find you to be the treasure. In Jesus' name. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.